Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, and uh, thank you to all of you for staying um, for this long. Um, I want to say just a few things about this. The first is that I know you've now been talking about this for two days, so I hope there is no complacency about just how brilliant a concept zero zero is. When, I, when it was first put to me very recently, something went off in my head. And the reason is, it's a, and let's be clear, this is a marketing device. This is a way of capturing the most important goals that the international community now has in front of it. And as a capturing device, as a way of making real to the wider public those goals, it is quite brilliant because it is clearly understandable and it has the same number for both and it brings together the climate and the development agendas in ways in which we know that there's huge been real tensions over the last few years. So the first thing to say is that the people who invented this, and I don't know whether it's the author of the principal authors of this, Ilmi Granoff and his colleagues, but let me commend this document to you. This is a, a really interesting analysis of the relationship between the two. So we've actually got two different things going on here. We've got a brilliant bit of marketing, political marketing, and we've also got a brilliant piece of analysis of actually how the two are related to one another. On the political marketing, you really cannot underestimate how important this is. At a COP, we see the international negotiation process at its most tortuous. It's not pleasant to watch. It's quite fun to be in, but it's not pleasant to watch from the outside. And you can miss the real goal here, which are big political decisions by governments at home first. What they bring to the international agreement is what they've had to agree at home. And those politicians in nearly every country are responsive to their publics and to the mood within civil society. And they will not do the radical things that need to be done, either to achieve zero poverty, still less to achieve zero emissions, unless there is a huge groundswell of public mobilization around those goals. They just won't do it. That is why we need, every few years, another big international moment at which we force the leaders to address these questions. That's why we had a climate summit. With huge credit to the UN Secretary General's team, they realized that you needed a moment well before Paris at which the leaders were forced to address the question. And it was actually, of course, the march which made the summit. It was the march which created that huge momentum around the summit. So, well done to the NGOs for realizing that an event which in itself, the climate summit, was not going to agree anything significant, was the mobilizing moment. And the reason why zero zero, in my view, is so important is it creates a mobilizing force which, if we can get the global public behind it, brings together these two vital agendas for next year, but well beyond next year. Helen talked about the mobilizations around opposition to the Vietnam War, uh, opposition to apartheid, the nuclear movement, and so on. We need this. We need politicians to feel that they are under so much pressure to do this that they start wanting to do it. And that's the trick. It's when the politicians want to do it because they want to be at the head of a public movement. So Zero Zero is a brilliant piece of political marketing, and I would uh, absolutely commend it. Two critical parts of that. The first one is, it is absolutely vital that people involved in poverty and in the development field understand and give priority to the importance of acting on climate change. This is growing, but it's not complete yet. People like Salimul have been saying this for, for many, many years, but it isn't universally true. And the core insight at the heart of zero, zero is, if we don't act on climate change, we cannot eradicate poverty. The pressures on poverty just grow with climate change, and you have to act on uh, climate change if you are to deal with poverty. The reverse is not true. We could reduce emissions without dealing with poverty. So the reverse is not true, but it has to be true. And this is the imperative to say to the climate world, if you do not act on poverty at the same time, you will be letting down the people who you are aiming to help. And it's to saying to the climate world, you have to have strategies for dealing with emissions, which also deal with poverty. And we know from the report of the New Climate Economy Project, the Global Commission 
on the Economy and Climate Report that this is possible. The evidence is now in. You can achieve economic growth and development while also reducing emissions. And the evidence from the development world is you can't do growth alone. You have to do growth with poverty reduction explicitly. So we now have the body of evidence, and this report brilliant, brings it together, I think, extremely well, that these things can be uh, done together. But those agendas have to be attached to one another, and zero, zero is a brilliant way of doing so. The last point is just about achieving these. Zero poverty is now well within reach in terms of a goal through the SDGs. It belongs in the frame of SDGs. That's how beginning to be how the absolute poverty target is being framed. Zero emissions is well off being the goal of the climate regime. And we have a huge amount of work to do to bring it into the Paris Agreement. It is the, the long-term goal that has caused amongst the hardest discussions over the last 10 years in the climate world. Countries have just been about comfortable with making commitments over five or 10 years. They've been very reluctant to agree the long -term, any long-term goal. So don't underestimate the difficulty that we will have in getting this into a negotiated agreement, but also don't underestimate the immense power of doing so. Why do we need a long-term goal? Not just because that is where emissions have to go, as Chris Field has said. There is no doubt about that. It's because the short-term commitments that will accompany the Paris deal will not guarantee us two degrees. In fact, they will be well off a plausible trajectory for two degrees. And yet we need the investors and the businesses who actually will make the decisions that will achieve two degrees to, be, to know that the world is heading in that direction. And so the long-term goal is in a sense the safeguard against inadequate short-term commitments. It is an absolutely clear statement to the businesses and investors, don't go high carbon, because high carbon is not where the world economy is going. And the long-term goal, accompanied by the five-year reviews and the ratchet and so on, is what will get us there. So the long-term emissions goal is a really important part of the Lima Agreement, because it is the way that pushes the world economy and sets expectations in the right direction. But there is a huge amount of work to do to get us there, and that's why the mobilization around this over the next year, unifying the 2015 story between climate and development around zero, zero, seems to me to be so exciting. And I think this is, I, I hope that we will look back on these couple of days as the moment when uh, an extraordinary movement was launched, which ended up with an extraordinary result, both in September and in December next year.